In the next section of our compression unit, we'll look at the most powerful text transform that, that I know of and that we'll present here. That's the Burroughs Wheeler transform. And it starts off as a really weird kind of idea, and it's not even clear how to invert it. Um, but it, it turns out after studying this for many, many uh, years, people found lots of uh, helpful properties. So this is really a, a, a cool trick that is a kind of a, a threshold innovation in that sense. Um, it enabled a lot of progress um, in this space. So maybe uh, um, I hope you appreciate it the same way or you, you find it as, as interesting as I did uh, when I first saw this. Um, I call it here a sophisticated text transformation technique. You'll be my judge. The, the key property is it takes the text and it just permutes the letters in a very specific way. Um, and it turns out that the outcome is more compressible in the sense that we discussed in the section on move to front. Specifically, it has locally low empirical entropy. If uh, the input text has some, has some structure, for example, English text or more general is uh, com has, has low higher order empirical entropy, but we didn't talk about that in detail. Uh, one, one other property that's not so great, actually, is that it needs the entire text up front. So it, it, it needs to work in blocks of the text or it needs the entire text up front. That's why when it was first invented, it was dismissed by its inventor as so impractical that he didn't even bother to write it up initially. He thought this is totally beyond the capabilities of computers. That was uh, in the 80s. And he, th he said, uh, that idea is, is cute, but it's so useless, I'm not even, I'm not even discussing it with anyone. I'm not, I'm, I'm not publishing it formally. And, and now it's a standard method that we run routinely. That's also a little bit of a lesson on algorithms and theory. Things sometimes sound purely theoretical uh, until they become very practical just by things speeding up. Okay, but for here, um, you need to work in entire blocks, so you need the entire source text available. That's unlike Lampulsive. And uh, specifically, the BWT, the Burroughs Wheeler Transform, followed by the Move to Front Transform. So we take our text, we, put, we make it low local empirical entropy. Move to Front makes it low global empirical entropy. Run length encoding, because there's a specific property I'll come back to. And then Huffman, these, these four things in a row, crazy pipeline, that's, uh, that's behind the BZIP program. It's not so well known, but it's a standard program on Unix. And you can use that to compress. And to convince you that it's powerful, I took some, version, some English version of the Bible. So it's uh, 4 million characters. It's just as a text file, just the, the plain text. If you do something like gzip, then you get it down to a quarter of that, roughly. If you use 7-zip, maybe something uh, people know as, by and large, often a good compressor. It's, it's a bit more slow. It's a bit slower, but uh, often gives good compression. That brings it down further, but bzip gets even, even further and is, is faster than 7-zip. So it's, uh, for English text at least, it's usually the best method in, by being fast and small. Now, <laughs> I wanted to add, this is something, um, it's a bit out of, out of the competition here because nobody's seriously using this, but you can go further. Remember the Hutter price that I mentioned at the beginning of this section of this unit? Uh, where there's a prize for compressing a, a chunk of Wikipedia text, and you can even earn half a million. Um, that was one of the competitors. It's no longer the best uh, tool, but it's one of those that are general purpose, uh, the pack compressor. It takes six minutes for this four megabyte text file, and after thinking for a very long time, it finds an indeed smaller representation. So there, you can do better than what I presented here, the BZIP program. But if you also want a reasonable compression time, then uh, there's usually nothing better. But for, uh, for completeness, I think this, this belongs on the slide as well. So what is the BWT? I hyped it up enough, I guess. Uh, we need one definition before we can get started, and that's the notion of a cyclic shift. It's a very simple thing, though. Imagine you have a, a, a text, and now you write this uh, along a circle 
and you just close the loop. So a standard string is a cyclic string plus a starting position, right? Where you know this is where I'm starting and then I read in that direction. A cyclic shift is the same, same circle, but I start at a different position. You can also explain it. You can take a bunch of characters from the beginning and move them to the end. That's the, the other thing that happened. And of course, you can do that with any number of characters. It doesn't have to be at a word boundary. That's just to make a, a more fun example. That's a cyclic shift. Um, yeah, that's, that's a nice one. So we'll come back to this in unit eight. Uh, the, uh, you, can make this <clears throat> you can make the cyclic shift unique, uh, uniquely re you can make the text uniquely reconstructable from, the cyclic from any cyclic shift by adding a special character end of string. Um, we'll do that a lot in unit eight um, for a similar reason, a uh, slightly different reason. But if you, rem if you imagine you have a, a special marker that tells you this is the end of the string, then whatever cyclic shift you take, you still know where the original end of the string was and you can just unshift it. So we can recover uh, the original text from that then. <clears throat> and that's what the Burris Wheeler transform also does. Uh, we do, from now on implicitly, we'll always have this end of string marker at the end of our string. All of the strings in this subsection will have that. And the examples will, will duly show this dollar symbol. By the way, dollar is just so, somehow, that's the convention. Um, it's supposed to be a character that comes before everything lexicographically. So we, we assume this is smaller in the alphabet than all the other characters. Uh, that happens to be the case if you put if you use ASCII characters, but of course, yeah, uh, only with the letters, the standard letters. Uh, theoretically, it's just any letter. You can pick whatever you want. Um, that's just the convention to show it as a dollar. <coughs> then what does the Burr-Wheeler trans Burr Wheeler transform really do? It takes all the cyclic shifts of, its, of a string. So um, I'll have an example on the next slide. <coughs> you sort them lexicographically as strings, uh, treating the dollar smaller than anything. And then you take the last column of what you get. <coughs> so here's an example. Um, it's this very, very uh, helpful but real text, alf eats alf alpha. Now you get all cyclic shifts by letting this dollar symbol slide forward. And of course, then anything that's pushed out of the left side is uh, appended at the end. That's all cyclic shifts. If we sort them, what we get is this. <coughs> and you see here, the dollar is the smallest. Then come all the spaces, then A, E, F, and so on. And whenever we have a tie, everything that starts with an A here, we sort by the second letter and so on. Right? The, if there's ties with the second and third letter even, we keep going. That's lexicographic sorting of strings. Um, okay, and the last bit is take the last column. So we just read that column top to bottom. And that's the Burroughs Wheeler transform. So spelled out here like this. Um, first observation, that has to be a permutation of the original characters. Uh, because here, <coughs> any column I pick in this, in this matrix has each position of the text exactly once because we shifted everything through by one position here. So any column has each position of the text exactly once. Now, when I take here, what I do by sorting is just reordering rows. I swap two rows or put one further up. That doesn't change the property that every column has each position exactly once. And so in particular for the last column here, it has every character of the original text exactly once, but scrambled up. And in particular, this is what you get in this case. If you think about how to compute this and how to compute it efficiently, uh, it is in the end possible to do it in linear time. So you're, 
uh, you can essentially produce the BWT in the same time as you need to read the text. This is totally non-obvious, though, if you go from the definition. Uh, you may recall unit 3 on sorting, where we discussed even this lower bound for sorting arbitrary things by comparisons. And there we said, ah, you need, you need at least n log n comparisons if you need n, if you need elements sorted. And there's n in total. And here we have n different things. If the text is n long, you have n different cyclic shifts. How can you get down to just linear? Actually, things are even worse because um, one comparison between two strings of length n could take time n. If I have two strings that have the same character, I keep comparing and they always have the same character, I have to continue checking. If I don't do, thing, don't, don't do anything smart, I might need linear time for each comparison. Uh, and so it could even be n squared log n with a, a standard comparison-based method. Um, but in, 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 in a way, there's n squared characters in this grid, in this matrix. So it feels like even to just read the entire matrix, you need n squared time. So how on earth, <clears throat> how on earth are you going to get this down to linear? Uh, short answers we'll see later. Uh, as a little precursor of why that should be even possible, is that, as you can see here, these characters are not really random, right? Uh, this, this matrix here has a lot of structure. These diagonals are all the same characters. So it, it is only possible to speed that up that much because these are all the suffixes of one big string. They're not arbitrarily chosen strings. OK, but for now, let's ignore how to do this in detail. We'll come back to this and spend uh, a good deal of our time somewhat soon on this. For now, let's just assume we can compute it um, and see what we can do with this. Now, if you look at this a bit more closely, the BWT, this last column, so it's just the same example from before, mm. uh, we can observe a few things. So if, um, if I have occurrences like in this string, there's alf, alf, and alf, that occurs three times. So I also have alf here, then I have another alf here, so that's the shifts where this alf is moved to the beginning. When I sort those three, the three will go together because they start with the same thing, and so indeed they're all together in, on the right. And so what is in the column at the end for these three occurrences of ALF. Well, it's a cyclic shift, so what comes before this moves around to the, other, to the end. So the character that precedes the occurrences of ALF are in the, last, in the last column. So here's a different example. This character sequence LF in this string is always preceded by an A because it's always ALF. Uh, and that means <coughs> we get a, a group of A's when we look at all the occurrences of, uh, let me maybe use a different color here. So if we look at the L, LF, then we get three A's at the back because that's always what precedes LF. So we get a certain grouping. Now remember when I said BWT gives you a locally low entropy? That's exactly that. If I have all A's, that's minimal entropy locally. It's, it's the same character repeated all over. Mm. A bit more generally, we can, we can say there's context. So there's certain substrings that occur several times. And if I, if I mark them here, I get whatever precedes them on the right group together. Uh, and as a special case, what we've just seen, if I have a, a whole substring that literally occurs several times in the overall string, then I get a run in B of these preceding characters. So run here in the sense of, of run length encoding again, a run of the same character is just that character repeated. Uh, and so, uh, 
I was, I was trying to give you some statement here, but I then found it too much of a detour to make it formal. So let's just keep it with this, with this vague statement. If in the text that you're given, that you start with the source text, it's possible to predict what comes before a certain context. So you have a certain context, a certain substring. If that makes it easy to predict what comes before that, con that substring, uh, then the Burroughs Wheeler transform has locally low entropy by this grouping condition. And so, what does this predicting like uh, look like? For example, in English, if I tell you I have the letters uh, H and E, what might come before H and E? Well, it's not it's not obvious. There's different options, but it's likely it could be a space because then it's he, or it could be a T, then it's an article, or it could be an S, then it's the pronoun she. There's a few options, but there's many options that are not plausible. It's probably not common to have a Z or a Q. I mean, Q is almost always followed by U. So there's a few things that you can rule out, meaning that there is a certain predictability from the context. OK, let's make this um, a bit more concrete in a bigger example. I hope it's still readable. So that's the text is not a super useful text, but I tried to find an example that's not tiny, but also still has lots of repeated parts so that something interesting happens. If you compute the burst wheeler transform, then that's this. And if you apply the move to front rule of, of the BWT, that's the result, OK? Uh, and what you see is there's a, lots of, there's a lot of zeros in the move to front transform of the BWT here. Essentially, half of the thing is zeroed out. And that obviously makes it compressible. That's, that's what much of the compressibility comes from. Um, the other thing, it's over, well, over all 24 characters in principle, at least. Uh, and it has spaces and so on sprinkled in. So it could have large numbers, like uh, here we had a 10 and an 8. But most numbers that occur are small, uh, relatively small. That again adds to the compressibility. And that's uh, indeed a general thing. It's not just in this uh, high hypothetical text. If you make a, a larger text and compress that in one go, you'll find half of the output is zeros. OK, uh, time for you to wake up. Um, here's the same, same example. I can go back to the other slide. Uh, I wanted to be very precise and look very carefully at uh, these different options. So this is one of the read me very carefully questions. But a few more people vote earlier on the attendance code, so I'll give you a bit more time.
looks like most people are, are done. So let me show you um, what the votes were. Uh, there's various votes for various things, right? Um, now, the, the answer I had in mind was this one. <laughs> uh, but let's go through all of those. This is, um, is insightful, I think, uh, to think about the others. Uh, let's stay here when we can read it better. So, specifically the question was about this long run of H's in, in this. <clears throat> so, what's meant is, is this, right? So we have a lot of a lot of H's that come in a row. That means they have the context here. I have to match this up. So they all have these this context uh, that groups it together. Now, H can be super frequent, but still be spread out in the BWT. So this first answer doesn't really uh, explain that. Um, if H is always at the beginning of a word, <coughs> that would mean it's preceded by a space, and the space characters would be grouped together. Uh, but there are usually other characters at the beginning of a word, so it wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a complete run in the BWT. Uh, almost all words start with an H. That's getting closer, but it's, it's not actually uh, the explanation here. Um, because that would lead to a run of space characters. Uh, so if, if you look here, everything that starts with an H, the, we have one, two, three, four, five occurrences of H at the beginning of a, of a word. Uh, these are the ones that are grouped together here, so it would give you a run of these space characters in the BWT, because the H is on the left grouped together. So that's also not quite the the explanation. H is always, fo always followed by an A. That's kind of, it's getting in the right direction, but it's kind of the wrong way around. Um, because that means um, when it, whenever you have an H, there is an A behind it, uh, but it doesn't mean that there's not um, other things that can come before an A. And those would split up uh, those would split up the run of H's. So really the main the main thing here, okay the last one I'm not even like a, not even a serious one. Um, all A's are preceded by H is what we get here because that means uh, all the A's are grouped together here and uh, if they're all preceded by an H, the previous character, which is wrapped around, and at the, at the end is always an H, and so you get this long run of H's. Uh, that question is not necessarily what, what I would want you to keep in mind about the BWT in general, but I think it's insightful to be precise in a concrete example, just to know how, uh, how the properties of the transform play out. Um, that's, that's what the target of the question was. Now, interestingly, you can also make a compression method just out of the BWT, where you take the burr wheeler transform and then you compress, like in this example, just the, the runs in the BWT. You don't even exploit the finer points of this low, local low entropy. You only express the <laughs> extreme cases of low entropy, which is a run. So you can use something like the run length uh, encoding that we've d discussed, but with one twist, you also have to say what character is the next one. Right? The run length encoding view that we did was just for binary alphabets, and then you know if there was a run of zeros before, then it has to be a run of ones next. Uh, but here you have the freedom. So you have to store the next character. And even in this tiny example, you see there's, uh, there's three runs longer than one. And in longer texts, if you take a big portion of the text, then that already gets, gets compressed a bit. <laughs> And it's, it's something that was a um, bit of a mystery for a long time. People knew this from observations in experiments, 
Uh, it's, it's a fairly recent celebrated result that put this in, in proper connection. So it showed that the number of runs in the BWT uh, can be upper bounded by this expression. So it's, it's essentially the number of, number of phrases in some Lempel-Sif variant. It's not the Lempel-Sif Welsh that we discussed. It's a, it's a variant thereof. It's a slightly different one, but it's not so important for us. Uh, time sum, something that depends on the length of the text, but it's, it's logarithmic in the length of the text, so it's a fairly small contribution. <clears throat> so in a way, that's, um, that's, that's a cute property, and I, I think it's, it's always cool to see results that are very young. Uh, but the, the proof of this is beyond the scope for us. <clears throat> 